Thank you. My name is Dr. Aman Chowdhury, and I'm the global lead for Responsible AI at Accenture. And I'm super proud and super excited to be speaking to this audience today to talk about what we've been working on in terms of responsible AI. And the title of our talk is From Virtue Signaling to Positive Action. And what we're here to talk about today is not theories and questions and imperatives, but actual solutions. So let's take a step back and think about what it is that we consider unfair. When we think about the word fairness, what does it mean to us? So this is an image of two individuals who were judged by an algorithm that determined whether or not an individual um, should receive parole, or their likelihood of recidivism, of repeating a crime. Now Vernon Prater was um, uh, judged to be a low risk. However, he had uh, shoplifted about $80 worth of goods from a Home Depot and had a prior criminal history. Brisha Borden, who was 18, had no prior criminal record and did a bit of a young kid stupid thing where she took a bike that was sort of left on the corner, rode it down the street and just dropped it. Um, however, she was rated a high risk, an eight. And this was the kind of thing that ProPublica saw when examining this algorithm that was deemed to be unfair. So why is this unfair? Because when individuals are treated unequally on the basis of characteristics that are arbitrary and irrelevant, in this case, race or gender, determining your likelihood of recidivism instead of your actual actions that you took, then fundamental human dignity is violated. So justice is a central part of ethics, and we should give it due consideration. And that's the question that we decided to answer. What can we do about this sort of unfairness that can manifest itself in our artificial intelligence? So we embarked on a data study group with the Alan Turing Institute. And this is a week-long session of investigation with some amazing researchers who, before I even talk about this tool, I want to uh, wholeheartedly thank for their time and their effort during that one week and also uh, in, with, our, with questions and things like that afterwards. So our data fairness tool is based on the concept of predictive parity. Predictive parity is this concept of algorithmic justice and equality. And as, as our definition of fairness um, laid out earlier, what we're, what we're looking at is how can we algorithmically make sure that different groups are treated the same, different groups of particularly sensitive backgrounds. So the first part of our tool looks at mutual information analysis. Now, kind of a naive statistical thing that people try to do when they run an algorithm is they say, well, I'm not going to put in race, and I'm not going to put in gender, and therefore it must be neutral. And that is simply untrue. The first part of this tool actually identifies se sensitive variables and how they might be related to other variables in your data set. So the user selects what is sensitive in my case. It may not be uh, gender or race, it might be age, it might be income, it might be nationality. And this tool will actually show you how related that variable is to other variables that you intend to use in your model and it removes that impact. So when you include that variable in your model, you're actually only seeing the impact of that variable, let's say, uh, number of children on your model instead of the number of children cross your age, which was an unintended inclusion of that variable. The second part of this tool is, oh, so sorry, <laughs> moving ahead. The second part of this tool is disparate impact. Disparate impact looks at the error rates for different subgroups. Again, for your sensitive variables, is the error rate for men different than the error rate for women? And this is particularly important when we look at uh, global error rates. When data scientists correct for error, we think about global error rate. So we may say, my facial recognition algorithm is 97% accurate. However, it is 97% accurate because it is trained on a data set of 70% white men. It is 90% accurate for 99% accurate for white men, but it is only 68% accurate for dark-skinned black women. That is the that is what Joy Bellamy's research out of MIT Media Lab shows as the actual numbers associated with it. So how can we say that our error term is X when when you divide it by critical variables like race, like gender, we're actually seeing disparate impact? Well, that's what we look at here. So you can select a sensitive variable, let's say age or gender, and you, ha and you can actually see how the error term breaks out for the different categories. We also enable the user to select a level of repair. Now, here's where I'm not selling you snake oil. 
There is no such thing as a free lunch. You cannot just fix for fairness and expect everything else to be fine. There may be an impact on your overall model accuracy. So we are actually illustrating what that impact would be and we enable the user to choose their level of repair balanced with the level of accuracy. So you'll see on one side we have the sensitive variables. You can slide over and make them merge together more, which is what you're looking for. You're looking for an error rate distribution among your different subgroups that looks roughly the same. Um, and then we actually see the impact it may have on your accuracy as the, as the repair level goes up. The third part of this tool is the predictive parity part. So we look at, for classification models, a very specific measurement, which is the false positive error. So going back to the original example of Vernon Prater and Brisha Borden, a false positive may be in this case that actually Brisha's likelihood to commit another crime was, was, was zero or very low, and this model incorrectly classified her. Um, and possibly that it incorrectly classified uh, Vernon Prater as being not likely to commit another crime, and then he did. So when you think about measuring these things, we actually can't measure, in this case, whether or not somebody you keep in jail would have committed another crime, right? That would be your false negative. In this case, we are able to measure, however, your false positive, and indeed, Vernon Prater did commit another crime. Therefore, he was an incorrect measurement of a, a low risk to commit a crime again. So that's what we can measure, is our false positives in many cases. So what we look at is your false positive um, for different groups. So it'll start out looking something like this. Let's say you take gender, and again, when we look at false positive errors as data scientists, we often look at a global false positive error. How often is it, how often have I miscategorized somebody as, let's say, a good credit risk overall? But again, when you break it down by the different subgroups, you may actually see unfairness. And in this case, going back to our definition of fairness, what we actually would want is not zero bias. There's no such thing as zero bias in a model, whether algorithmically or in any other way. We, we actually do expect things to go wrong sometimes. But why are we so upset when it's something like the, the compass algorithm? Well, in this case, because this error rate is not evenly distributed across different people. So in this case, for example, we're seeing higher false positives among men than there are among women. In other words, more men, let's say, are being allowed free or more men are being granted uh, loans incorrectly than women or people who classify as not, neither male nor female. And what we're actually able to do is equalize that error term. So again, we, you can, the user selects um, the level at which he would want it, and then you see what the fairness accuracy trade-off is in this case as well. So, um, with that said, I'm going to do the most untechy thing ever and talk about the limitations. Um, I truly believe is a cultural problem we have in our tech community where we are not allowed to talk about the ways in which our tools might not work or might be wrong or the things you should look out for. And this is what leads to some of these problems. We are incentivized to oversell. So I'm not here to oversell. What I want to tell you is about the limitations. Because guess what? You can't push a button and fix for fairness. Because society in the world is an unfair place that is reflected in our unfair data and ultimately in our unfair models. So as much as I wish we could push a button and make the world a happy place for all, we can't. So our limitations, one, you can, you can really look at one variable at a time. You cannot just go through multiple times and fix every little thing, uh, every variable, and think that you will have um, a perfect model and a perfect data set. When I used to teach data science, uh, what I would find is that every student's initial reaction to building their first model is what, building what I would call the kitchen sink model, where they would put every variable in, and then you'll see something like, you know, shoe size correlates to your likelihood to, uh, likelihood to rain tomorrow. So obviously you're picking up spurious relationships. So what I will not say is this tool solves for everything. What I will say is that this tool invites conversation. It illustrates problems. It solves these problems. It asks you, the user, to think critically about the data you're using, how it's being measured, how you're applying it in your model, even the kind of model you're choosing. What you might find is that when you try to do the repairs, your accuracy goes out the window and it's terrible. Well, that's probably an indicator that you need to revisit your data and your models. Nobody said this would be pretty. I just, I'm just trying to help you arrive at better artificial intelligence.
And this is why we've built out a process called AI Launchpad. It's Accenture's responsible AI consulting practice. And it's built around five pillars. Technical, under which we have tools like the fairness tool and our algorithmic impact assessment. Our brand, which is about whether or not the artificial intelligence you're building is reflective of your company's values, your brands, and also what public perception might be of what you're trying to build. Often companies are trying to do good, trying to build a good thing, but it falls into that uncanny valley that creeps out or alienates part of their user base. We're actually trying to help companies understand that realm as well. Third is about governance, key and probably one of the most critical parts, if not the most critical part of Launchpad. How do you create good governance around your artificial intelligence? Things like internal ethics review boards, um, how to make these groups relevant, how to empower data scientists with a chain of accountability so that they can report errors that they see, because it's not just the job of a data scientist, right? You know, I understand, I was, I was one myself. You are there to run a model, uh, you know, to create a product. If you do not have a culture in your company that enables you to raise your hand and say, hey, I think there's a problem here, the problem will not be solved. So it's not just about an individual engineer and an individual data science, but an entire company being behind this. And that leads to the last pillar, which is organizational, which is about how your company is structured around artificial intelligence, whether you're making the right sorts of considerations about people, upskilling, the future of work, and also the ethics of what you're building. And on that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Hugo Pinto, who's also announcing another tool we're building. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I guess to build on top of the fairness that we're trying to bring into the projects that we develop with our clients, we also thought that actually fairness needs to be available for everyone. And if you've been involved in some of the conversations, you've seen some of the titles that are coming out on the media, right, which actually bring out a lot of the problems of biases, and especially when AI services are starting to hit most consumers worldwide, right? How many of you have used a facial recognition system to access a service, to soon to open the door to your house, to access your car, to make payments, et cetera, et cetera? It's becoming really important to bear in mind that these services are starting to impact with a potential uh, impact to specific target audiences and groups. So let me start with a question. How many of you have auto, auto tag turned on on your social media profiles where you put some photos on? Some hands up? Quite a few of you. So did you hear about this debacle with Facebook, right? It's, it's very serious, very, very serious. And how many of you have recently researched the word CEO and see what the first, right? You don't need, to, you don't need an, an AI algorithm to detect the pattern on that specific uh, picture, do you? The other thing is, there was a really interesting story, and I was really inspired by, by Joy Blowimni, um, which apparently also inspired Ruman, uh, so clearly some genius talent there, uh, when she spoke at Wired last year, and she talked about this case of uh, people needing to use facial, facial recognition to access video conference rooms in offices, right? And funnily enough, it worked really well if you were male or white, right? It probably didn't work as well. So, you can imagine the role of a female um, that needs to actually be as productive as the male counterparts, needing to ask someone to access a meeting room. Can you imagine your day of having to do that in your office? I, I don't think that would be a very dignifying experience, right? So because this is becoming so important, there was a few key problems that we started uh, clocking and identifying in AI. The first one is citizens are totally a part of the loop. Right? We only actually get either the outcome, which is typically not the best, of when things are done wrong, or we just get the big media terminator images. Um, the second one is regulators need to find a way to redesign their role. And I've heard this across many conversations. Citizens and regulators are the two almost missing links. It's like you have companies uh, and developers and data scientists figuring out what to do without actually bringing in the right parts that need to have a say in how this works. And that was when I started actually thinking that um, it's up to all of us, right? And we need to start doing a few things. We need to start bringing um, public and pri private sector together to responsibly co-develop these solutions. It can't be just the companies. It can't be just the government. 
They both need to come together but because they both have a responsibility and they're both accountable in this. Second one is citizens need to be informed and empowered to have a say, right? Currently they're not. Currently you cannot go somewhere and say, I do not want my data to be used for this type of purposes. At the same time, there is nowhere where you can go and volunteer to actually donate your data and say, I want to contribute to the well-being of the whole humanity. And third one is we need to demonstrate new ways to actually regulate this activity. I think the time of actually written words to um, oversee written contracts is gone because now a piece of code goes online and something in a few minutes could have an impact of, in millions of people's lives. So governments need to adopt code to actually start enforcing law. And more importantly, not in a fixed manner, right? Uh, previous uh, data legislation in Europe from GDPR was probably, what, 20 years old? Um, so it needs to start working more rapidly, more agile. It needs to keep up with all of the trends because it's not just AI. It's all of the other digital technologies that are accelerating and are exponentially having an impact on people's lives. So with this said, I think there is something that we can do and the project that I'm here to announce is actually what we intend to do about it. First of all, we intend to empower uh, citizens, give them a user interface where they can donate their data. And when they donate their data, they, their data is now available to be pitched for a use of AI, which means on the other end of this, let's call it community, there will be a developer trying to develop an application that requires that um, uh, data point to train their model, right? And if we have enough uh, users of all of the groups and we have an unbiased data set that can be used by any developer, non for profit, this is not to make money. This is to expand on the vision that everyone that is creating applications, including startups, research, that are potentially gonna have an impact on all of our humanity, it needs to work with the right data sets. It needs to evolve from the right principles. At the same time we do this, once you actually get your data uh, helping to test that algorithm, we can produce a scorecard and we can start identifying what is the impact of that algorithm across all of the key biases, gender, ethnicity, nationality, skin color. Um, and finally, we can show that information back to the citizen and tell them what their data was used to produce. So actually show them what AI in reality is doing in the real world. Second, what their role is, because their role is to actually make a decision on this. And previously you used to say, well, you can't ask 10 million citizens about something. Well, guess what? With technology nowadays, you actually can. And that's gonna create a massive difference. The other thing, and I think what was underpinning all of this is, why not surface that information and empower regulators for them to understand what are the key levers they need to pull? What are the things that they need to pay attention to? And what are the key areas that they need to actually intervene? So this is not about creating a system that creates more um, uh, entropy to the evolution because typically there's this trade-off between legislation and innovation. It can't work like that, but it needs to work in parallel, in real time, and across all of these dimensions. And the only way we can do this is actually together. This is not uh, just one organization. This is all of the developer uh, organizations, all of the new businesses, all of the startups, all of the governments and all of the citizens needing to work together to actually create more responsible AI. And for now, we're focusing on image recognition alone because of the big impact that it's, it's having already in our lives. But I wish to inspire other people to actually come up with solutions for all of the other areas, natural language processing, other forms of machine learning. And if we do this together, and if we share our learnings and actually prevent other people from making our mistakes, I'm sure AI will actually produce more positive than, than bad results in the real world. Thank you.